Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, show we code a complete game live on stream. Yesterday we did some rudimentary uh, float printout stuff uh, because we, you know, had replaced printf and uh, we needed to replace the float printing. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really know what we're going to do today because that, you know, here we are, we're on day 330 and I, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty to do. But uh, that was definitely, we finished sort of that, that bit of it. Um, so we are currently printing out floats like a champ. Um, they're not, it's not a very good float printout routine, but we don't really need a very good float printout routine. Uh, we just needed something that would print out floats. Uh, so I don't know at the moment what we should be doing. I'm going to take a look at the to-do list. Uh, and also, maybe we can take a look. I don't know if we can go uh, to GitHub uh, and, and see. Um, I think I can sign in here and see um, what's going on. Uh, we could take a look at some of our bugs and see if we can just finish up a few more bugs. Uh, but after that, we're going to have to pick something new to dive into because uh, at the moment, uh, we don't really have... Uh, we're, we're, we finished the thing that we were working on. Uh, so let's take a look here. Uh, I don't know what this is. Type punning through pointers instead of just casting. Um, what are we talking about? Star uh, where value is a void star. This could instead be written as umm value or umm value. Uh, I don't care about that at all. I don't. That's not a bug. Why would that? I feel like if you're going to put a bug in, it should be a bug, right? That you would have you have to demonstrate that there is some. This is not a bug, in any way. Is it? Why is this in here? All right. So that's good. Uh, so let's see here. So we've got a couple other ones here. Uh. For, again, for Clang stuff. Uh, these, and then we've got a few other things here. Switch to constant power panning, rate count pointer. Okay, so this one I believe we fixed, right? In format string list, we're using a rate count on the temp care pointer. This gives a length size of eight for everything. So this was the one that I fixed. Um, so I believe this was fixed on day uh, 329. Okay, let me move that up there so I can actually see stuff. Okay, uh, so that's good. And uh, let's see what else we got here. So a couple other ones. Um, so these two are the clan compatibility ones. This one, uh, it looks like we've got a situation where uh, if we can't load, if handmade tool is one but debug game frame and fails to load from the DLL in the function with the debug system will accumulate data, data but will not be collated. Okay, so we, we basically have a problem of we'd keep, we'd keep gathering debug info until we run out the buffer, and that would be bad. Okay, well, good to know. Uh, yeah, we could probably fix that. And then what's this? It's just a constant power panning uh, from this forum post. This is a pretty small, easy fix. I want to ensure that audio maintains the same intensity across the whole panning field. First, the panning range of negative one to one needs to be mapped to the range of pi four to represent the panning field and radians. Uh, then the panning for the LR channels is calculated. Oh, so that's just a, you're sort of doing a rotation around. So that's expensive. Uh, that looks real expensive though, uh, right? You have to do a sine cos uh, inside the loop there. Um, I don't think I like that uh, for this, unless we really had a situation where we were hearing it uh, be a problem. I don't know if I like that because here's uh, what they're sort of saying, uh, and I don't disagree with them. Uh, what they're saying is that, Uh, I, th I think anyways, is that if I have a, a source uh, and I move it like this, right? 
And here is the listener. Uh, it's actually, if I just linearly interpolate it between the two speakers, it's technically getting closer to me, right? Like the distance here is obviously less than the distance here. So if the speakers do their job faithfully, then we would expect to hear it get louder as it passes through and then softer again, right? Uh, which I assume is what this is talking about, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so what they're sort of suggesting is, you know, you can kind of go uh, and, and interpolate an arc, right, uh, as you go through here. And that arc would, would then make it so that you're not going to be... Uh, you're not going to be getting that, that bit there. But I feel like this looks really uh, expensive to me. So I might say, are we sure that that is the, the right way to make that trade-off? Like, you know, let's say we were going to do constant power panning, and maybe we didn't care exactly about perfectly linear speed in the pan. Uh, you could imagine another thing we could do, which is is to renormalize this out to the arc. So do the linear pan, and then just use a, a, a rever reciprocal square root to normalize back out to the arc, so we wouldn't have to do cosine and sine, right? Um, so for example, we could imagine some function that's like, okay, yeah, uh, you know, we have a pan value, right? Uh, and the pan value is negative one to one. Uh, but we want to make sure that, that it gets interpreted constant power uh, as, as we go through, right? Uh, and so, yeah, in order to do that, uh, what we could do is sort of say, well, uh, I guess the problem is we need the volume. Yeah. trying to think about how we would do this. Because uh, what we want to know, right, is how loud this point is going to be uh, in the left channel and the right channel. And I'm not sure exactly how to map it directly to there. Uh, but I don't love this because I just don't know. If I remember correctly, let me double check and make sure that I'm not Mis, uh, mistaken, maybe I am, but I thought our audio uh, was per sample interpolated, and I don't remember. If it's not, then it's not a big deal because you only have to do that once, uh, but I didn't know if the pan was animated, right? So do we have pan at all here? Uh, let's see, output playing sounds, loaded sound equals get sound, get next sound chain, uh, D volume, uh, um. D volume chunk. Chunk to mix. Volume ends at channel index. So it looks like we are actually not really doing panning in that sense inside the mixer. We are just sort of outputting uh, into the mixer. We are outputting uh, a, like a per channel volume, it looks like, right? Uh, let me see here. D current volume. D volume. So we do, you can see here that we do volume per sample. So if we're doing volume per sample, then I don't want to be doing like a sine and a cosine and a, uh, in the middle there, right? Uh, that just doesn't seem like a good idea at all to me. So I don't know how I feel about that. I would say that um, probably we could work out a thing where we, you know, uh, where we did some kind of a uh, approximation to it using only uh, using only R squared because that'll be faster. 
Uh, but I don't know that I want sine and cosine in there. I feel like they're going to be too expensive per sample for me to really want to do that. Because um, there is no sine and cosine instruction. You have to actually issue a series of instructions to generate a sine and a cosine. And the sine and the cosine, uh, they're not short. Uh, I'm just going to randomly pick some ones here in case it's, hopefully there is one. Uh, I don't know if this is one here. Let's see if there's a sin in here that I can just, just so I can sort of point to an example. Um, uh, if there is one. Okay. Uh, so here's a sign function, uh, right? And you can kind of see what's going on here, right? It's, it's quite a few instructions uh, to make this work. You know, it's it's 20 or 30 instructions or something probably in here, maybe, hard to say, because um, you've got to do all of those uh, and then all of these, right? Uh, probably, maybe even, yeah, I think 30 instructions or something like that. And 30 instructions for sample in addition to what we've got, you know, um, I just don't know. I just don't know if I if I like that. Uh, let me verify that we're actually in fact interpolating uh, the volume. Yeah, we are. So I mean, you know, it's already we're already doing what uh, about six instructions here or something like that per sample. So we'd we'd be uh, we'd be you know making our mixer like six times slower or something like this to add that feature, and we don't really know if we ever need it. So I think I'm going to say no to that one. So that's going to get closed. Oops. Uh, so what else we got here? Uh, let's see. We've got texture environment being set in the wrong place. Uh, that's definitely true. So I believe we just kind of cut and pasted that code. Uh, and basically what happens inside OpenGL is texture environment stuff. Uh, why did we not find that? Where is GL, where is our, oh, because I didn't open the project file, that's why. Uh, so GL TexEnv, it looks like we are setting that, for some reason we're setting that here, which we don't need, and here, yeah, those, that is not where that should be set. So text parameters are set on the texture, so those are appropriately going with the individual texture, uh, but gltextmvi uh, is a property of the pipeline. It's the property of like what, this, what the current drawing state is going to be. Uh, so really that could be set kind of globally. Uh, and in fact, we never change that texture environment. So we should be able to set that up just in our init um, and leave it on. Right, so like when we are uh, originally initializing things, we should be good to go. So if we wanted to, uh, we should be able to do that. So for example, um, I think we could probably put that right here uh, and just leave it there for now, uh, since at the moment we don't do any multi-texturing or anything like that. Uh, so that's probably fine, right? Uh, okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, so this one's a little tricky. Uh, 
uh, because I don't know very much about uh, this. So we might have to go look that up a little bit. But Martins, who probably many of you know from the forums, he answers a lot of people's questions that they have uh, about things Handmade Hero related and otherwise. Uh, he was pointing out on the forums that there is a recommendation from Intel that if you are going to spin lock uh, on a... Uh, if you're going to spin lock on some kind of uh, variable like we are doing with our ticket mutex, uh, which I think we used for like uh, texture updating or something like this, right? We got uh, one right here. So when we are putting these operations in for the textures, um, when we do those ticket mutexes, we're really in there for an incredibly short period of time right? Uh, three, three assignments or four assignments is all we're doing, right? So the thing is, I don't really know if it makes sense to issue an MM pause in the case where there's that few, uh, but maybe it does, right? Maybe it's always better if even if you're going to only spin like once, on the spin lock. Maybe it's always better because the CPU can do something smarter. And I just don't know. Uh, and since I've never really used MM pause, I'm not sure what to make of it. I don't know whether it's a good idea to use it or not. Uh, but essentially what it is, is inside, when if we look at the um, implementation of it, inside the ticket mutex, basically all you do is inside this while loop, you put the MM pause be, you know, as the, the essentially instruction that you're executing. And what it's supposed to do is let the processor architecture know that you've got one CPU core waiting on some other CPU core because then it will do something smarter in theory. Now, I don't actually know what it will do and that's what worries me, right? I don't really want it to do anything like downshift that core power wise or anything like that uh so i'm not really sure uh, let's see so in the software developers manual let's see what martin's referenced uh he says 8102 Okay, uh, so the pause instruction can improves. All right, so they got a little uh, grammar mistake there. That's okay. The pause instruction can improve the performance of processors supporting hyperthreading technology when executing spin weight loops and other routines where one thread is executing a shared lock or a semaphore in a tight pulling loop. When executing a spin weight loop, the processor can suffer a severe performance penalty when exiting the loop because it detects a possible memory order violation and flushes the core processor's pipeline. The pause instruction provides a hint to the processor that the code sequence is a spin weight loop. The processor uses this hint to avoid the memory order violation and prevent the pipeline flush. In addition, the pause instruction depipelines the spin weight loop to prevent it from consuming execution resources excessively and consume power needlessly. Interesting. When it exits the spin weight loop, the processor can suffer a performance penalty when exiting the loop because it detects a possible memory order violation and flushes the core processor's pipeline. I guess I don't understand how the weight, the pause instruction would fix that because it doesn't know what else you did in that loop. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand what how it is that exiting the loop would cause the flush in one case but not in the other just based on the presence of this instruction. Hmm. Let's read 8.10.6.1. In 
Intel recommends that a pause instruction be placed in all spin wave loops that run Intel processors supporting Intel Hyperthreading technology and multi-core processors. Software routines that use spin lock weight loops include multi-processor encoding primitives and idle loops. Such routines keep their processor core busy executing a load compare branch loop while thread weights for resources become available, including a pause instruction such a loop, greatly improves efficiency. The following routine gives an example of a spin weight loop that uses the pause instruction. The spin weight loop above uses a test, test, and set technique for turning the ability of synchronization. This test record for a spin like loops. Because we're earlier than the before, the pause instruction has a NOP instruction. So it really doesn't tell us very much about what this thing does. Um, I am just not sure what to make of that. It seems like, based on what it says it does, that it should be strictly a benefit to put it in there. Like, it does not sound like it's doing anything fancy like downpowering that core or anything like that. So, you know, it seems, at least from the documentation, that it would be harmless to add. And so if it actually does uh, give us, you know, confer upon us uh, some theoretical benefit in terms of not flushing the pipeline on an exit from the loop, uh, then that's cool. But, uh, you know, how do I know that? Because I don't feel like I really understand it. Um, you know, in general, it's definitely, it, it makes some sense because you, you could imagine the processor looking at the loop and going, okay, I'm doing all this loop code. I don't have any idea when I'm going to exit this loop. So my, my um, pipeline just consists of a ton of compare uh, jump instructions that I'm looking to, to try and do, right? And so when one of those finally says, no, don't keep looping, obviously the entire pipeline is wrong at that point. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I guess if I understand what they're insinuating here, it would mean that the pause instruction is the signal to the CPU not to un uh, to, to go forward in the loop in that pipeline like that. So maybe what the pause instruction does is it says, "Hey, Mr. Read Ahead, like stop reading ahead, uh, like or stop, spe don't do any speculative execution, like just do this thing exactly as it is." Uh, so don't do speculative execution. That way, uh, when we when we do jump out, you don't have to flush anything. And hey, we know there's no benefit to speculative execution because all you're doing is reading from a line that you don't control anyway. So until someone else lets go of the line, uh, you're not gonna do anything, right? Um, I mean, I can see that. I could see that being implemented in the processor. That makes some sense to me. I wish they gave a more specific explanation of, of it so that I could verify that that sort of cursory uh, understanding that I just sort of said uh, actually bears some resemblance to reality because I don't feel like the documentation here really gives me enough to go on to understand what they're actually doing uh, in practice, which is possibly intentional. You know, a lot of times they don't want you to know exactly what their chip is doing, and that's fine. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a little confusing. So what that would imply is that, you know, in here we would put one of these, uh, and presumably that would just, uh, make things work a little bit better. Um, and in theory, it shouldn't change the execution of our program at all. Uh, it just gets rid of a little bit of a pipeline, a potential pipeline stall, uh, during the spin lock. So, so there we go. Okay, uh, so let's say that that was okay. Um. All right, so yeah, we'll leave that in there. Uh, let me go ahead and bracket that more. And uh, yeah, and there we go. Uh, so now we've got quite a few of these issues down. 
let's take a, a last look at some of these guys here. Uh, maybe we can do these two. Uh, these are clang compat ones, which we were sort of trying to get to. These, uh, I thought wrong meters to pixels we did. Ah, okay. So th this was a, we fixed it for our main code, but we still have the same uh, problem. So maybe we should uh, do this to do as well. So that's another one we can do. Uh, all right, so we should be able to do this one. We should be able to do this one and this one. Uh, this one I don't know if we'll do today. Clan compatibility wise, I don't know where we're at on this. We have problems with the macros uh, and I don't know how much I want to deal with that because as far as I'm concerned on GCC, you know, uh, if you can't run the debug system, I'm not sure I care uh, as far as uh, cross-platformness goes there. If it means I got to deal with more macro nonsense, which is always a pain. So I don't know if anyone's figured out how we can do our macros the way we want to do our macros. Uh, but yeah. Um, so let's take a look at the other ones instead. Uh, let's take a look at this. Us usual arithmetic conversions are apparently applied to the type argument, the vr macro. This caused a problem when calling the macro. Um, error from GCC. Uh, and Clang, let's see here. Second already variable is of promotable type U8, undefined behavior, because arguments are promoted to int. Um, okay. I guess I see what that's saying. Where did we do that? So, I guess what I don't understand here is, are we essentially saying that there is no way to read one of these uh, under any circumstances? Uh, meaning you cannot ever do a read var. Because I thought the idea was that the integer length field stuff specified this, but I guess what we're saying is, well, hey, it's going to get promoted to an int because the compiler defines all vararg functions as promoting their arguments to ints if they can. Uh, so maybe the, the case is just that when you do integer length, uh, where do we actually set that? So we don't support 64-bit integers yet, it looks like, either. All right. Well, so if integer length is always four, uh, then I guess what we could do is say, you know, in general, um, no matter what you try to read, if it's gonna be promotable to an int, then it will be promoted to an int, if that makes sense. Uh, and then if you are actually 64-bit, then it'll read that. But I think that that, does make sense because uh, my recollection of how, uh, and we were never calling that code path, so that would have been like a bug, but we just would never see it, right? Uh, so it probably is better to write it that way because if you were to pass a care, um, like a, a, a one byte integer or two byte integer, if you were to pass those down, uh, you would definitely see those being um, converted up to integers, right? Because that's the definition of it. Now I assume that care we did the same way. Yeah, you can see uh, we did that. So uh, I assume that this is actually, this to-do could be removed and that is exactly what it should be. Uh, so I think, I believe we fixed this uh, on day 230. I believe that is the correct thing to do there. Okay. Uh, passing via list as a pointer. Uh, so you wrote Linux and OSX, VA list is defined as an array type. Okay. This caused a problem when passed as a pointer in the read var arg uh, functions. GC has a similar complaint. Uh, so can the function not viable, known conversion from built in VA list star uh, for a second argument. So I don't know what we want to do about that. I guess what we could do. Um, Let's take a look here. Read var arg signed integer. 
Um, I'll be honest, I don't super understand, however, why we are not able to take the address of it. I guess because it is not really an actual value on the stack, I guess. Um, so I'm not sure what the fix for that is. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's Stack Overflow, but the answer is good. Uh, okay. So we essentially have to wrap it into something. Hmm. Well, that seems like a really, like if I may, that just seems really stupid in general because it's like you need to be able to pass this to utility functions. Um, but okay, let me take a look here at what I think would be the most expedient way uh, to fix this. So we pass the VA list to format string list and it's gonna call a read var arg float, um, read var arg assign integer, right? It's gonna call uh, these guys here. Um, so what I guess is true is, you know, I could macro these guys um, and that would work. Uh, I mean, you know, I could do something like this. Not sure I love this idea. But Here you go. So I could do something like that, right, where it's a macro now. And so since it's a macro, it'll just operate directly on the VA arg list uh, that it's actually using. Um, does this not get called? Ah, it does. So, and now I would have to remove the address of situation here, right? Because now I just want to pass it. I just want to like use it as an argument to a macro. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to actually pass it as an address anymore. I want to just use it as is. And in theory, uh, that would just work. Uh, I gotta do the other ones here. So pound define, there we go. Uh, so this would be another one. These are backwards here. Uh, just need to do basically the exact same code. Uh, So if the length is eight, then we want to use the 64 bit read. Uh, and if the length is not, then we use the 32 bit read. Okay. Uh, and finally, exact same thing uh, for this guy it's just doing the signed version of it. Uh, so this guy's a little trickier, um, but actually I don't know that we need to do this anymore because I can just basically copy this code, right? I can just say like, okay, this is pretty trivial to do here. 
Might as well just copy it one more time and say, well, all right, let's use a signed uh, value everywhere for that. So in theory, I think that would work. Uh, and I'll verify that we didn't break any of our code, but we'll need somebody on GCC to test that out uh, since we're kind of just shooting in the dark here, trying to help them out. Um, okay, in theory, we fixed this on day 330. What a pain in the butt. Totally unnecessary and I don't like it at all. Uh, okay, so, oops, I think we had one more. Uh, yeah, and so I think the only one, the other one I wanted to do here was the wrong meters to pixels one. Uh, we could try one of those two. Uh, this one and this one are kind of going to remain for a little bit. Uh, so this one is just, we've got the same uh, meters to pixels computations going on in the cutscene code, right? Um, so here's our cutscene code, meters, let's see here, meters to pixels. Uh, so we've got our meters to pixels code, and uh, we've got the to do for unify the stuff. Uh, and uh, like if we go over to world mode, I think uh, you can see the code is the same over here. So you can kind of see uh, we've got the, the same things, exactly the same things um, being defined multiple oops, uh, multiple times. And so the question was, do we want to try and unify that? Um, now that we sort of have a different, um, now that we've fixed the equation to be right in one place and it's wrong in the other place, do we want to try and do something uh, smarter here? And the answer is, I don't really know. It seems like probably the easiest thing to do uh, would be to just have a thing that, that does just this one piece. Uh, so, you know, if we want to share this, we could do something like, um, you know, standard camera params or something like that. Uh, and we could have width of monitor, um, meters to pixels, uh, focal length, you know, and then we could have like get standard or, you know, we could even do this uh, camera params. Uh, and that could just return Uh, whatever we think the right values here would be. Uh, so we believe at least at the time being this to be the case. Uh, so all we would need is something that passes the width Uh, and then off we would go. So yeah, I don't know if focal length gets used anywhere else. It doesn't. Uh, meters to pixels, it doesn't. Width of monitor, it doesn't. Uh, so probably what we can do is just say, all right, standard camera params, camera equals get standard camera params. Uh, and we can pass that draw buffer with uh, to the function. We can keep this comment. Uh, and then we can just say, all right, get rid of all that and grab those out of here. Um, Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I feel like that's pretty reasonable. Uh, get standard camera params right with width, standard camera params undeclared identifier. That's because that's not what it's called. It's just called camera frames. Uh, so if we were to then share that, uh, you know, and I could put that in the renderer or something, I'm not really sure where that would be most appropriate. Um, but yeah, you know, let's say we just put that in there for now, then I can just go back over to the cutscene and call it. Uh, the same way. 
Uh, and then we can always adjust the parameters if we need to by having some other function that lets us pass something uh, in there more specifically, potentially. But let's go ahead and uh, start with that, and we'll see what happens. Um, And uh, yeah. Now that may mess up all of our camera settings, right? So we may have to readjust the fo that focal length um, to make sense for what we're trying to do here, right? Um, like you can see that that's like all of our scenes are going to be a little bit wrong. So we may have to kind of uh, have a thing where maybe you maybe you pass the focal length in because I think all of these are going to be like a little bit wrong. All of the all of the layouts for these guys are going to be a little bit wrong, uh, and we're going to have to you know they're they're going to be too close in. Uh, so I think what we want to do there is just say like okay let's you know we've got that one. Uh, we know that the focal length was three uh, on this one. Let's change the focal length to other things and see what happens uh, until we get something that's a little bit better for us. Uh, let's see if that's a little more uh, like what we wanted for our cutscene stuff. Maybe something like that. Can we speed up the time step here at all? We need better sliders. But that looks like a pretty good focal length for what we're doing. Uh, so the question is, does that work for the game as well? Should we just leave that focal length for everything? No. Uh, so I'm just going to make it so that you can pass the focal length here. Uh, and then we'll just pass the one that we actually want. So in cutscene, uh, when we call get standard camera params, we'll pass 1.25 because that's what we were using uh, for that adjustment. Uh, At which point it's kind of stupid that we're even passing in there, but hey, we'll leave it that way. And then we'll pass three for the other one. Ah! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, we won't pass three, we'll pass a third. Okay, uh, so I think that's good now. And uh, we can close that guy off. So let's see, how are we doing here? We have four issues remaining. Uh, we've got a failsafe in here and we've got the client compatibility one. Uh, so I think that's good for now. Although I guess since we've got, what, we've got 15 minutes left, I suppose if we have 15 minutes left, we could do this, take a look at this failsafe one. Uh, this is not really a bug that we care super much about because it wouldn't affect end users. But, uh, you know, like I said, we've got 15 minutes, we might as well do it. Um, so let's take a look uh, at what it's talking about. It just says that, you know, when we do Win32 load game code, obviously Win32 load game code could fail, right? Because it's trying to load the game code 
Uh, but if it can't for some reason, like the game's being recompiled or whatever, so again, not really an end user scenario, but it is a, a developer scenario. Uh, when we call Win32 load game code and it can't load the game, uh, then what's going to happen is it can't do debug end frame. Uh, it can't call this because it won't be there, right? Uh, and so I think the idea is that if it just can't ever reload it at all, uh, then it gets into a bad state where it is uh, just going to accumulate debug things forever. Uh, and it can't, ever get, it can't ever flush them. So I'm not sure Shouldn't there be a global debug table thing in here? I forget. It's been a long time. There it is, debug table. Uh, so record, record increment, uh, I think, is the thing that stops recording from happening uh, if we wanted to stop recording, right? In fact, there it is. Uh, debug set event recording enabled. Uh, that would turn it off. Uh, so what we probably could do uh, is we could probably do something like this. Um, and then, uh, you know, turn it back on again. Uh, but it looks like we're actually doing that here. So when we tried to reload, if the game wasn't valid, it should have turned it off. In fact, why didn't that happen? I guess it doesn't happen if the first time through. Like, when is executable needs to be reloaded? So I suppose what we need to do here is do this at the outset, probably, right? So when we do Win32 load game code the first time, what we probably want to say is like, uh, okay, set event recording to whether or not the game is valid, like right off the bat. Um, that's probably the only thing we would really need to do. Uh, and we could test that, right, by saying like, okay, game is valid equals false, and we could say game uh, debug, uh, what is it, end frame. So we could nuke it and uh, set, set that up and we could see how it goes. So yeah, I think that's probably fine. But I'm not exactly sure because this is not something that's ever happened to us. So I'm not 100% certain. Uh, so I'm not sure. Um, so let's take a look at is valid. Uh, so it looks like we're also missing this, so that's another problem there. Okay. Okay. So that probably does it. Um, but we'll let that be confirmed by whoever wanted that actually fixed. All right, so now we're just down to uh, clan compatibility here because this these two are are sort of not code things. Those are things for me to do someday on my own. Um, these are uh, the clan compatibility ones that are still there, and uh, probably what I would say is. 
I'm going to need somebody to figure out of this of the things in here that we haven't fixed. I think we actually fixed some of them. Of the things in here that we haven't fixed, what uh, actually do you want me to do about it, right? So somebody has to come up with who uses Clang and GCC on a day-to-day -day basis so they can test it. Figure out what solves this problem and then I'll do it. Uh, but I can't really speculate as to how to fix their macro processing very well um, because I don't am not running with them. So it's pretty hard to do at that point. And these, I guess we already did. So all of these are done. It's, it's just the macro debug macros that are a problem. And then I think we could close this issue. Uh, so someone, if someone wants to do that and send it to me, then I'll take a look at that. Otherwise, I think uh, we're good. So let's go ahead and end it since we don't have any bugs left right now. Uh, to, we can look at, let's go ahead and end it uh, for today and go to the Q and A. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can take them now. Casey, is there a bug with chunk creation? You added a free list, uh, but are not using it. Um, well, uh, we could certainly take a look. Uh, so let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, So what what makes you say that what makes you say that telconfig could you um could you be more specific uh about that perhaps I'm going to look at Martin's thing uh he said he caught a copy paste bug that I did on the stream so I'm going to go fix that while you while you type in more stuff when doing copy pasta, you left F64 cast in wrong place for turning operator. Ah, thank you. There we go. Thanks, Martins. When you found yourself unable to write code for something, what would you do to try to find something to do for said project? Um, well, uh, I guess what I would say about that uh, is there's there's a couple things. So one, uh, if you're having if you get stuck on a problem, then there's a lot of things you can do to get yourself unstuck on the problem. If it's if it's a if it's the problem that you can't figure out how to do the code, right? You can talk to some uh, other programmers about it. You could post on the internet about it, like a blog post and get, get uh, help from people. I mean, you can ask about it on Handmade Hero. People do that often, right, even. Uh, you can try experimenting, try like writing some little side code to try and get more traction on the problem. There's a lot of things you can do for that. On the other hand, if your problem is just that you're doing a really like sloggy problem that takes a long time and isn't very rewarding to work on till like the end, and you're having trouble just staying motivated, doing all the work that's necessary to get it going. Um, you know, sometimes it is just a slog, and sometimes you know you gotta you gotta grind through it. And my advice on that is just don't stop, right? Like sometimes you're gonna be down, and you're only writing two hours or three hours of code a day or something because it's just such a slog, and you're not feeling good about it. But you gotta keep writing code because writing code is the only way you're gonna get yourself out of it. And it's not because you just need to pile code on top of code on top of code. It just means you gotta keep trying things and until it clicks, until the stuff works. And so the worst thing you can do is get yourself in a situation where you stop writing code because you think you're just gonna have an epiphany and then it's gonna be clear how to write it all. It's like, no, don't do that. That's rarely the right thing to do. 
Yes, the code that you may be slogging through that doesn't seem like it's right and you're confused and whatever. Yes, it's probably the wrong code. Yes, you will probably have to delete it, right? But that's not the point. The point is getting the code out there and trying those things is what will get you to the epiphany. And if all you do is just sit there and sit inside your head all the time, you probably won't be able to get there because if it's a coding problem, like not a math problem, you know, then it's probably too in intricate for you to really see the truth in it just inside your own head. Uh, and this is the problem I have with a lot of those kind of like super formal methodologies like U UML diagrams and all this sort of nonsense is because they really aren't any good for things that are complicated and that's the only time you really need them, right? And it's because you actually need to see how the real code works because the details are where the, tr the trickiness and the complexity lies, not the abstract bigger picture. Most, usually the abstract bigger picture is clear. Like I just want to do this thing to this thing or whatever, right? It's very simple to state. It's all of the minutiae that are important. And so sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where you're having a lot of trouble. I still have this to this day. I often do that when I'm working on new architectures like that. Often, often, it is not unusual. It's not because you're a bad programmer or anything like that. Something good programmers can have happen to them uh, throughout the entire course of their programming career if they're, if they're continuing to challenge themselves and, and if they don't stagnate, you know? Uh, and so, I would say the most important thing to do during those times is to be persistent and force yourself to write a few hours of code every day. Never let it drop to zero, right? Never let a hard problem uh, stop you from writing some code uh, to try and experiment or push on the problem because eventually you will get it if you are persistent and keep trying things. And so that's real important. And there's been many times uh, in my programming career where I've gotten into a state where it was really grim but I just kept coding a little every day and eventually I clawed my way out of it as my brain sort of started to internalize all the things and I got enough tries in the area and I saw how it sort of started coming. I was like, ah, okay, now I've got it. And then I go, right? But you can't get, you won't get over that hump if you stop coding. You'll just sit there in paralysis forever until you start. So never let your coding rate fall to zero is like probably the biggest single piece of advice I can have, I uh, can give for people who are tackling difficult new problems where they don't know the solution already or they don't know how to write the code correctly already, uh, that's really the most, the single most important thing to do is never stop writing code every day. Um, and if you can't think of what to write that day to help you solve the problem, just pick something random. Be like, I don't know, I'm just gonna try something. The first thing that comes to mind if I have to, right? Uh, even if it's a long shot, even if I know it's a, it's a O2 oh, to the N solution to the problem, write it because in writing that thing you will at least learn something and your brain will see something uh, and that's what keeps it going and will eventually get to the solution yes that code will be throwaway it won't be what you ship but that's okay because sometimes coding is not about writing code you're going to ship it's about getting your brain to the state where it can write the code you're going to ship and a lot of times that involves code too it involves throwaway code and that's okay so just know that and don't spend a lot of time fussing with that code. Like don't try to make it pretty or do any, you know, fanciness to it. Write it as ugly as you want, but just get it out there, get it working um, and let that push you forwards towards the better solution. Looking to start a career in programming computer science. I'm currently 16 and in grade 12. Any tips on what I should do? Uh, also, thanks to the chat for all the help. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the best way to start a career in programming is just to be doing a lot of programming, right? Um, there, there's so many resources out there to learn programming. You should just be programming a ton on your own. Uh, and if you program a ton on your own, you will get good enough that you should be able to, like, you know, make some blog posts or post some things to start getting people to notice that you're, you know, okay at what you do, that you're learning. Uh, and that's usually how you can sort of start to get, you know, meet some people on the internet through those things that you can do. And then you can start talking to people about, you know, like, oh, can I have an internship, whatever. Um, so I don't really know these days what the easiest route is, but I would say, you know, the one thing that I can say has pretty much always been true throughout all of game programming history is the best way to get yourself in a position to have a career in programming computer science is to do a lot of programming every day. I've never known a good programmer who didn't. 
I know a lot of bad programmers who don't. Long Boolean, it has been a while since uh, we've seen some of the C time stats that are being collected, uh, if you have time. Uh, sure, I think we can do that. Uh, we have been keeping those, right? Um, uh, in here, no. In here? I don't remember where I put the C time stats. Well, I don't remember where I put them, so let me take a look. Uh, handmadehero.ctm. Looks like it'll be in the build directory. Uh, right? Oh, no, it's after the pop D. So it'll be in the code directory. So I must have been looking right at it. Uh, let's see. Dear handmade. Here at CTM. There we go. So my stats. Uh, so here you go. Um, you can see some stats here. Uh, we have spent a total of 23 minutes building throughout the life of the project uh, for successful builds and nine minutes for unsuccessful builds. We have tried to build the thing um, uh, over 1,700 times, which is funny. Uh, you can look at our averages. Uh, we tend to spike out at about three seconds, it looks like. Uh, this is 181 days per bucket. That's how many builds we did? Did we really do 181 builds in one day? I'm not sure what that's telling us. Oh no, it's 4.5 days per bucket. Okay. Uh, and there's one day per bucket, so there we go. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's fine. All right. Uh, so yeah. There you go. Is that the stats you were looking for? Um, let's see. What is the current schedule of the stream? It seems that we have been dealing with bugs for a while. Sorry, I may have missed the explanation if you provided it a little while ago. Um, we don't do a schedule for streams. We just work on whatever we're working on day to day. Token fig, when we get the chunk in get world chunk, it seems we always allocate new memory. Uh... Well, when we get the chunks, that's in that's in here. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. In get, uh, in here, you mean? Or w we're talking about this guy? Uh, I guess. To the best of my knowledge, let me see. Uh, to the best of my knowledge. I guess I'm not sure I remember, do we ever, when do we actually add chunks to free lists at all? Uh, so do we put the whole chunk? We do. So when we load it up, we put the whole chunk in the free list. Uh, so we add the chunk to the free list there. And then later on, I guess when we pack, we're gonna do the get call. Right? Are we? I don't know. Let's find out. Uh, map into chunk space. When do we actually get the chunk? Map into chunk space. Pack entity into world, get world chunk. Yeah, I think you're right. So it looks like we aren't actually recycling that memory properly. I agree with you. Uh, so in here, when we do get world chunk internal, uh, we're getting back, uh, you know, most of the time a chunk that already exists perhaps, but sometimes if we've deleted that chunk, then there is no chunk there. 
Uh, so then we will find that we need to allocate one. And in that case, uh, when we do the allocation, we should be checking the free list first, right? Uh, we should be doing something more like, you know, if uh, let's take a look here. Uh, so if result equals world first fruit chunk, uh, and so you know, always take it off of the free list basically. And what we can do is just say, okay, if there isn't one on the free list, uh, then we'll push uh, a new one on. So then we'll do the allocation in that, in that case. If there is one on the free list, right? So after we get it, um, we can just say uh, that it's equal to the next uh, one on the free list. So let's see, next, probably, I'm assuming we use next in hash uh, for chaining. Uh, but I could make that a little more explicit. So uh, we could do, yeah, it does use next next and hash, right? Uh, so here's what we're doing. We're just saying, okay, we come through here. If there isn't anything on the free list, then we'll add one to the free list, right? Um, and uh, in this case, we do want to do one clearing operation, uh, which is that the first free chunks next and hash pointer should be zero so that it knows that, that it's only getting one off. Uh, then when we actually go to allocate one here, we say, okay, get the first free chunk, advance the, the next pointer, set it all up, uh, and off we go. So I think that uh, we'll, we'll properly recycle uh, the, the free chunks now. Thank you for uh, finding that one. Uplink coder, what makes a bad programmer in your opinion? A bad programmer is the programmer who doesn't get code done that can be used, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, that doesn't doesn't write code that can be shipped, you know, or, or takes way too long to write it. And there's a lot of subtlety that goes into it, but that's, you know, the basic idea. About your build.f file, why do you disable uh, exceptions and warnings? Uh, exceptions because we don't use them. Uh, and the warnings are, uh, we disable ones that I don't like. Like they just bother me and I don't like them. Looks like Miblo, a related thing mentioned in a creative writing course I did was to postpone perfection. Yes, I, that, is a good, uh, that is a good way to think of it, Miblo. I do think postpone perfection is a nice, a nice way to say don't spend too much time trying to think of how to do something perfect. Just get something and learn from that and then, you know, kind of build on it and try again if you need to. All right. Uh, I am going to, I think, uh, are we in the Q&A right now? I think we don't have any more cues. Am I wrong about that? I don't know if I'm wrong about that or not.
So it looks like there are no Q colons left, so I guess I will wind it down. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It has been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with the source code so you can do your own experiments uh, and play around with it. We also have a forum site you can go to if you want to ask questions, a Patreon page you can use to support the video series, a schedule bot that tells you when we're going to be live, and an episode guide uh, that has all of the old episodes on it if you're trying to catch up. Uh, that's about it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, have fun programming, and I will see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.